There is nothing I love more than an amazing meal with high quality meat cooked at home because let's be honest, eating out is so expensive. And you also know that eating out is the number one budget buster. That is why I am so glad I found ButcherBox. ButcherBox is a premium meat subscription service dedicated to delivering high quality, grass fed and grass finished beef, organic chicken, pork raised crate free and wild caught seafood directly to your doorstep with free shipping always. You even get exclusive member deals, recipes, and a variety of high-quality cuts at an amazing price. New users will receive their choice of two pounds of ground beef, three pounds of chicken thighs, or one pound of premium steak tips for a year. Use code ETM and get $20 off your first box at ButcherBox.com. Last night, we made a beef stew with meat from ButcherBox, and you can taste the difference. It was so satisfying and delicious. And all of our friends that were over for a dinner party, they raved at how good it was. So do yourself a favor and eat better this year with the best meat and seafood on the planet delivered to your door. ButcherBox is offering my listeners their choice of a weeknight meal essential, three pounds of chicken thighs, two pounds of ground beef, or one pound of premium steak tips for free in every order for a year. Plus, get $20 off your first order. Sign up today at butcherbox.com slash etm and use code etm to choose your free offer and get $20 off. When it comes to financial advice, you got to trust the source. It's why you listen to this podcast. When I'm looking to upgrade my wallet, I turn to NerdWallet. Their expert team of nerds dives into the details to help you find smarter financial products. Before NerdWallet, I was paying for vacations all wrong. (laughs) I was missing out on miles. I didn't even know I was leaving on the table. Now I've got a new card with more miles and more upgrades. What could future you do with more travel rewards? I don't know, maybe that fancy hotel upgrade that you have always been dreaming about. Wherever you go next, make it happen with a smarter travel credit card. Don't wait to make smart financial decisions. Compare and find smarter credit cards, savings accounts, and more today at nerdwallet.com. NerdWallet, finance smarter. As with all cards, credit is subject to lender approval and terms apply. So one of the biggest things that people need to keep in mind is there's a lot of misinformation but certain core principles that have never been taught hold more true than ever, such as ensuring you're invested in really long-term things, uh, in particular things that are really high-quality businesses that you understand. And this is beyond just a stock tip you might get at the dinner table. So one needs to make sure that they're armed against all these different tips that are going to come your way and have a great investing foundation to make sure that you're educated. You're listening to Millennial Money with award-winning money expert and serial entrepreneur, Shauna Come to Game, where we flip the script on the old school approach to everything your parents never taught you about money. Each week, Shauna creates a safe space by talking with special guests from around the world about money wellness, entrepreneurship, traveling like a boss, and what makes millennials tick. Unique stories, trailblazing perspectives, tips, tricks, and everything there is to know about money. Find it all here as you uncover your money story and unlock the life you want to live. Pretty cool, right? Here's Shauna, money expert, Indiana Hoosier, and burger aficionado. Algorithms can do so much more than control social media feeds. In fact, they have the power to save lives and improve our health. At the Weizmann Institute, Professor Yonina Eldar has pioneered innovative algorithms that optimize MRI scans and make ultrasound devices more portable, affordable, and accessible. Professor Eldar's lab develops AI tools that can pave the way to new technologies that can see, hear, and communicate beyond existing limits. Learn more at CelebratingGreatMinds.org. Hello, it is so good to have you here. Look, we are wrapping up 2021 super fast and furious. It's really hard for me to believe that we're actually at the end of another year, but I wanted to bring you one last week of amazing episodes just to end the year super strong. Over the last year, overwhelmingly, the topic that you have requested over and over and over again is more investing episodes. So here is one last one for the year. Our guest today, Joe Percoco, he believes that the world does not know how to make money, and he's really here to change that. 
You see, the way you've been taught about investing, it comes from old school money thinking. And in order to really build wealth, you have to change not only your thinking, but also how you invest. So Joe, he's co-founder, co-CEO of a cool company called Titan, which is a fintech startup whose aim is to become this century's answer to fidelity investments, aka the old school way of investing. We're going to get rid of that. So Titan has been backed by famous investors like Kevin Durant, Odell Beckham Jr., and Will Smith. So I encourage you to get some more cozy, grab a beverage of choice, and let this episode be a spark of the new way of investing going forward. I'm so excited to bring you this one. I'm Shauna Compton Game. This is Millennial Money. On to the episode. So I've got so much that uh, I really want to dive into. You say that uh, the world doesn't know how to make money and that you're here to change that. I love that mission. So it kind of feels fitting, I think, to start here. So what are we missing and what do we, I guess we really need to know about how to make money? Oh, that's a great place to start. Um, I think quite literally, it's like one of the most important subjects that one should know about that's never taught. Right. Um, no one, uh, ironically enough, like I went to Wharton undergrad, which is known to be a place of finance. And I came out of that school knowing nothing about how to manage my own long-term wealth, <laughs> <laughs> which is kind of ironic, love war into death, but they missed the boat on that one. Um, and so that is quite literally what we mean when we say the world doesn't know how to make money. Um, there's like a fundamental lack of education on what it means to invest and grow one's long-term wealth. Right. Yeah, I got an MBA and I would say the exact same thing. It came out of that and looked around at my peers and realized that nobody knew anything about personal finance and <laughs> yeah. that obviously we we all really needed this. Why, why do you think this isn't taught? Like why do we, why are we still having this conversation that personal finance is something that we don't really educate people on? You know, I've thought about this a lot and there's no right answer. I can tell you what it, my working hypothesis Oh, I yeah. Let's go I, with that. Let's go. Okay. Working hypothesis. I think things that have costs that aren't immediately felt mm. equals you often disregard the importance of said thing. So like, example, not going to the gym or eating healthy. There's like no real cut. Like if you go crush burgers for like 14 days straight. There's no real cost over that 14-day time horizon. Over, let's say, a six-month period, maybe you start to notice some changes. And so imagine, even like extrapolate that further, imagine something where you were like unable to notice changes in an alternative universe and you weren't, and you never knew it. So like you arrived and you're 50 years old and you have, I don't know, like a $2 million retirement account. You have no sense of like, you could have almost had 4 million and what that 4 million could have got you is private education and a new beach home. So my hypothesis is that investing and money management has this deep but imperceptible cost and hence it doesn't get the focus it should. Hmm. Wow. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's kind of mind boggling. <laughs> yeah. That's a great, great term. Uh, for me, it was, uh, yeah, it was, uh, it, what the cost that manifest, manifested itself for me was I was, uh, at least for my high school, the person that, you know, went to an Ivy league school and ended up being able to live in New York, knock on wood, very privileged. And the cost was, I had a lot of friends texting me, asking me, how should they manage their money? And I literally had no clue. Right? <laughs> it, so the cost was I was embarrassed. Right. right. I had no idea how to do it myself. And I was blown away because here I was, you know, studied finance and so on. And so that embarrassment was like, holy moly, I need to actually go do something about this. Right. You start scratching your head going, wait a minute, I just spent uh, or somebody just spent a lot of money <laughs> to go to this school. And hmm, what did I actually walk away with? <laughs> yeah, I, and it, it did. Like I learned so, so much and stuff sure. that's enabling to help me run the company today. Right. But, you know, for, for one's, one's physical health, you have a doctor to supplement one's education, i.e. 
you do not have to know everything about the inner workings of your body. You go get advice for it. And it's funny that for one's financial health, um, it, you're sort of like left in the dark to a degree. Right. And it's universal. We all have the same experience. We're all just kind of out here with our hands out, like just trying to figure things out. It's, it's, um, I don't know. It's so interesting to me. And uh, another thing I want to talk about that's really been on my mind. I know it, it's something that you talk about too, is this, you know, the, the very real wealth gap that's happening and, and getting wider and wider. You shared a stat that millennials are four times poorer than their parents at the same age and that baby boomers control about 55% of the stock market, which, I mean, another thing that just sort of blows my mind. So how do we, I mean, how do we build wealth with with this kind of working against us? Yeah, it's um, it's not an easy environment right now. Um, I definitely think, you know, one of the greatest weapons someone has to go arm themselves in the world is education. And so the first, one of like the biggest and most important subjects one can educate themselves on is why Einstein said compound interest is the eighth wonder of the world. Like of all the other things that could have been the eighth wonder, he chose this seemingly jargon term that makes one's eyes roll over. And he said it was compound interest. And so it's almost like the math of like, if you can grow something at 20% every year, by the end of 10 years, or by the, by the end of 12 years, you've literally 10 X that thing. If you have a hundred grand and that thing grows at 20% of the year, you're, you will have a million dollars. And he's like, this is magic. This is, this is beyond belief. And so if people could educate themselves on what it means and how huge it is to get long-term investing right and the, the like multiplication that it gives on one's financial health, it's like a massive step forward. And to your point, it's I'm like, okay, I might not be in the right position today or I want to be, but at least I see a path. And then you can solve for a number of other things. Okay. What's the right savings amount I should have? Actually, I think about budgeting, but the, the, the house of let's call it like good financial health cannot be built if you don't at least have the right principles in your foundation to summarize it. Okay. So I know that so many listening, we're all obviously at, at different stages of life. We're all at different incomes. We're all at different beliefs about money, whatever it might be. We're all at different places. But I know that that so many people, especially the last couple of years, really have <laughs> felt the pinch, maybe living paycheck to paycheck or just uh, things are just not as as good as they were before uh, 2020. What, what if we don't even we don't even make a lot of money or we don't think there is any kind of extra money there to to start walking in that path of, of compound interest and really building wealth from there? Are there things we can do with maybe things we're missing that that even if we were to start with just like a small amount of money, it it could really start at least pushing us in the right direction? 100%. I think you put the answer right there, which is a great one, which is starting small is precisely what one needs to do because small small beginnings can have really big endings in particular if you understand what it means to just invest appropriately and watch it grow each year versus pulling it out or shifting it to cash like when you're nervous about the market and like that is like you shooting yourself in the foot and so you know i recognize we've had a a cuff tuple few years just now because of covid which is like really pressing everybody so i think in particular, when the world you know needs to do some healing, making sure you rely on that foundation and those principles. So, like, okay, starting small can matter. If one does need some supplemental income, fortunately, we're in the best history of the the best moment in history to go do that via all these supplemental income sort of sites where you can find extra labor. Um, the recruiting market's coming back, so I do see personally, I see a really big inflection point coming. But that comes with the humility of knowing we are at a tough point in time and turning the corner does require to turn the corner. 
So I'd imagine there's also like a, a mindset shift in there, right? Of um, just kind of, you know, it's easy to get stuck in your day to day money situation, not really see a way out. Even it, it doesn't it doesn't matter how much money is there. I think we all, you know, have felt that from from time to time. But I'm, I'm thinking maybe there's even like a mindset shift there that happens about kind of going back to these money principles we're talking about and and starting to make some of those you know seemingly small steps. Yeah, hundred percent. I, I think the 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 mental game, as you note, is probably the more most important piece of the puzzle. Because uh, like the example is, um, you know, most people or like whether it's like at the at Thanksgiving table or at the home for the holidays, people might casually be like, "Wow, this market is really up and down," and then everyone starts to question like where they're invested and. In. Are they going to pull all of their money out and hide it <laughs> under the mattress? Right. And I, I do this with you know my own cousins and my own parents, and I often debate: Do I go with the polite answer or do I go with the like bagel shop talk, <laughs> shot to the heart? And like the the nice answer is: Oh, well, tell me about your goals, and then you inductively walk someone to being like, okay, you should stay invested. The bagel shop talk would be like, you idiot. Like, this is just turbulence. <laughs> the plane isn't going down. Now, if anything, possibly might be the, a time to invest more during volatility. That's not investment advice, just posing it theoretically. Um, and so I often struggle personally with what's the narrative I should use with my own friends and family. Um, but you're totally right. It's like the mental game comes first. I would imagine you are the life of a party right now. <laughs> <laughs> I, possibly. I, I definitely am the, in those settings, I'm like the one people definitely ask certain things, but uh, I do, it does require a ton of empathy as you, as you've noted. Um, it's really tough times. Um, lots of people, there's lots of misinformation. If you flip on the TV, they're probably yelling and screaming about you <laughs> about this new COVID variant. And so it's like really difficult time to just try to stay calm and ignore lots of things. So I, I feel most people. So you talked about, okay, you, you came out of Wharton and you realized that you didn't know anything about personal finance or how to really build or accumulate wealth. And, and yet people were looking at you for this information. So how did you kind of go about you know, that process of, of figuring this all out and, and really figuring out how? How do you build wealth? Oh, that's a really great question. Um, like first, my head game to go back to the mental point, I was like super inspired to figure this out. I was like, all right, I got a bunch of friends back home counting on me to figure this out. I got to figure it out for myself. Um, many of my family members weren't too educated on the subject. So I almost felt the duty to figure it out for them too. So I started having a number of conversations. I was privileged enough to be educated in Warren Buffett investing philosophy in college. And so then that next step was like, okay, how do I bridge, you know, it, it, him being an all-time investing, you know, wealth management great. How does that apply to the everyday person? And so my exercise is fundamentally bridging lots of these abstract advanced principles to the small beginnings that we were discussing. And it took me a bit of time uh, I had a conversation with now the other co-CEO of Titan, which is Clay, and he had the opposite uh, upbringing. He like bought his first stock when he was 14, and he's like an investing prodigy. <laughs> and so me being sort of patient zero and being expert zero, we were like, wait, if we're doing this for ourselves, why don't we try to go help as many people in our generation as we possibly can? And you know, just sort of, sort of starts to snowball from there. Yeah, I love that. I love the idea of like, well, let me just learn it for myself and then let me go out and teach other people because I think that's really how we start, you know, really making change for people. Um so kind of kind of going back to investing, uh I love that you you share, you know, we take a lot of care in buying goods and services from companies that really align with our values. Like I think even more so now, a lot of us are very selective of who we buy from. Uh, maybe some of us not so much. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I might be guilty of that from time to time. But when we're thinking about our investment portfolio, obviously there's a lot of conversation about 
uh, sustainable investing, investing in companies that are really doing good in the world. But we don't often really do that with our investing. I think most of us aren't even like really sure what we're investing in. Tell me a little bit about that. Like, how do we begin to kind of bring those two things together? Yeah. One of, one of the biggest ways to, you know, bridge that gap in particular, like understanding what one's investing in, um, uh, it, it's, it, it's, it, it's a hard question because part, part of the, part, there, there's almost like a tale of two answers here. Half the answer is you should get educated on how to invest your personal wealth. The other half of the answer is this is a discipline that people will spend decades trying to master. So part of it is like, like I, I will not try to learn neurosurgery in case I have to give myself brain surgery. <laughs> like there's some, so there's, I, I hold simultaneously two thoughts and it's a deep paradox I hold. One is everybody needs to be hyper-educated on how to manage their personal wealth. The other thought is one should have the humility to know that it requires master a, a world class sense of expertise on whether one should buy Facebook stock versus Google stock. This is not just Thanksgiving chit chat, whether you like Facebook's news feed versus Google search engine better. And so those two thoughts I hold in my head. And I'm often often thinking through how to talk about both of those thoughts. And so I do think both a desire to really, really understand and take those baby steps and really know your personal wealth with all the humility to say, I have no clue about this aspect. It would probably take me 10 years to figure it out. So I should probably go get some help on that dimension. So how do we know who to go get help from? Because we live in an environment now, especially with social media, where it feels like everybody and their brother has a, has a tip, and, uh, <laughs> yeah. some advice, or you know, it's it's almost like it's it's too much now, where it's hard to really decipher who do I actually go learn from. What do you what are your thoughts on that? I'd probably say first here, human instinct like really serves yourself a long way. So. Should I be taking advice from this TikTok influencer who started trading crypto two years ago <laughs> on equities? <laughs> I'll give him credit for the crypto part. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> um, be like, okay, probably not because they don't seem to invest in stocks. Um, should I take information from, you know, the guy on the, the guy or girl on the street who's yelling and screaming about like this new hot tech IPO? Probably not. Um, should you go like someone who's a trained professional who's demonstrated a track record of success in some way? It's like, okay, now we're starting. And the, the fun part is that that ladder category comes in all different shapes and sizes. Um, there could be, you know, more stodgy sort of financial advisors that work at a lot of these bigger Wall Street firms that, you know, either don't necessarily communicate in millennial language or frankly are in, are unaffordable or inaccessible. There's, you know, um, there's like research that one can like look up online. Um, that's hard sometimes to parse through. There are actively managed products. So like mutual funds or active ETFs or Titans, a company I run, we, we have our own approach. Those sorts of products also do the trick. And so in this instance, it often depends on what a person's goals are, but I deeply empathize that there are so many different routes to get information, just being able to have the instinct to, to siphon through it, um, you know, can be challenging for folks. Financial anxiety, anyone? Yeah, you're not alone, but worrying about it, it doesn't help. Earnin does. Earnin is an app that gives you access to your pay as you work up to $100 per day or up to $750 per pay period. You just download the Earnin app and verify your paycheck. Then you can access up to $100 per day as you work and leave an additional tip. Any money you access plus tips are automatically repaid from your next paycheck. So, how would you spend the money you get from Earnin? Well, 
Honestly, my hubby and I have been feeling a little bit disconnected lately. That's what happens after you've been together about 12 years. So I would spend the money on a special date night with dinner and maybe bowling, you know, to bring back some of that giggly excitement that we both felt at the beginning. Make Earnin a part of your financial routine and join Earnin's over three and a half million customers who say things like, when I think about Earnin, I think about financial stability, security, gives me a lot of peace of mind. Download Earnin today, spelled E-A-R-N-I-N, in the Google Play or Apple App Store. When you download the Earnin app, type in Talkin, T-A-L-K-A-N, money under podcast when you sign up. It will really help the show. Talkin money under podcast. Subject to your available earnings, location, daily max, and pay period max. See earnin.com slash TOS for details. Earnin is a financial technology company, not a bank. Bank products are issued by Evolve Bank and Trust, member FDIC. Listen, if you've been using Mint to manage your money, I have got some news for you. First, the bad news. As you might know, Mint is shutting down for good. But the good news, well, there is a way better alternative that is a personal favorite of mine, Monarch Money. And I'm not the only lover of Monarch Money. Many Mint users are turning to Monarch Money and just raving about it. I used to manage my money with an Excel spreadsheet. I know, so archaic. And it was so time consuming. I tried all of the apps, but I just didn't find one I liked until I found Monarch. And I've got to tell you a secret. Monarch is so easy to use with a very intuitive design. You can even collaborate with your partner and you can customize Monarch for whatever your needs are. Monarch is the top rated all-in-one personal finance app. It gives you a comprehensive view of all your accounts, investments, transactions, and more. Create custom budgets, set goals, and collaborate with your partner. And now get an extended 30-day free trial when you go to monarchmoney.com etm. Let's go back to the collaboration bit. Because we know money is a leading cause of divorce and breakups, Monarch has built-in collaboration features so you can invite your partner at no extra cost. You can see all your finances, make a budget together, get insights on your cash. Yes, cue the confetti. There will literally not be any more arguments over money. And if you've been frustrated with personal finance apps that are cluttered with ads, difficult to use, or rarely updated, so was Monarch. They built a new kind of personal finance app that's intuitive and powerful ad-free, and constantly improving based on customer feedback. Monarch has a tool that allows you as well to easily import your data from Mint. You can keep all of your tags and all of your categories. After trying Monarch for myself, I understand why it's the top-rated personal finance app. And right now, get an extended 30-day free trial when you go to monarchmoney.com slash etm. That's M-O-N-A-R-C-H-M-O-N-E-Y dot com slash etm for your extended 30-day free trial. Millions of people have lost weight with personalized plans from Noom, like Evan, who can't stand salads and still lost 50 pounds. Salads generally for most people are the easy button, right? For me, that wasn't an option. I never really was a salad guy. That's just not who I am. But Noom worked for me. Get your personalized plan today at Noom.com. Real Noom user compensated to provide their story. In four weeks, the typical Noom user can expect to lose one to two pounds per week. Individual results may vary. From Foreign Policy, I'm Rena Ninen, the host of The Hidden Economics of Remarkable Women. Over the past few years, we've looked at how women around the world are changing societal norms to increase their economic power. This season, we're focusing completely on girls, how they're pushing for a brighter, more powerful future, and what the rest of us can do to set them up for success. Join us for stories about girl power, young women who are fighting for change, to give themselves a chance to live a life of their own choosing. That's season six of The Hidden Economics of Remarkable Women, wherever you get your podcasts. Whatever you're saving up for, a CD from Sandy Spring Bank lets you grow your savings at a guaranteed rate. Right now, earn interest at 4.5% APY on an eight-month CD special or 4.25% APY on a 14-month CD special. Learn more at sandyspringbank.com slash cdspecials. Minimum opening deposit to earn the annual percentage yield is $500 for the 8-month CD special and $2,500 for the 14-month CD special. Member FDIC. A hundred percent. Yeah. And and I guess the follow-up question, which we could probably spend an hour talking about, is 
how do we know, speaking of investing, like how do we know what maybe a better word to say is like, what are we actually looking for to figure out if an investment makes sense for us? We're now into this. We have now shifted to advanced territory. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Astrid <astronaut laughs> warning label. I know, no, no, no. I mean that from like, okay, like yeah, everybody roll up your sleeves. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll, I'll say the, or like here's our Warren Buffett where any of like the investing greats think about looking at an investment. And d- believe it or not, the principles remain remarkably cons- like remarkably similar from investing in windmills in the 1960s to investing in hot internet stocks in today's day and age. And then we can talk about what that means for um, someone just more broadly thinking about their money. So diving right to the heart. All right. H- how do they think about this? There's only a few traits that really, really matter. One is, does this business have runway or does this investment have runway to grow predictably into a very, very large opportunity? And I tried to say that in a non-investing jargon way. Like, (laughs) is this thing a part of something that's declining, i.e. brick and mortar retail? Or is this business a part of some mega tailwind? where it will be able to capture its own slice of that mega tailwind, i.e. let's say like Amazon and e-commerce. So that's sort of one, like does this business have runway to grow? What are the factors we're looking at when we're trying to figure out that runway? Is it just kind of thinking about the business from a just sort of general perspective of like what's going on in the world? Or are we looking at like actual metrics? Uh, both. Um, okay. So if, if you were an investor and you're doing a deep diligence process on investment, you're looking at things ranging from, all right, what market do they play in? What's the expected growth rate of said market? And then how is that pie being divided today and tomorrow? I.e., how many competitors are fighting for a slice of this pie? What in particular about this specific player or investment makes you believe that it will have a fighting chance to have a really large and growing portion of this pie? Um, What qualitative indicators suggest that customers who are buying uh, this business's product are going to stay around and not switch to competition. Um, so you can just go down the list of like those sorts of things. You can almost like, you can almost like fil- filter Apple, the business through that little checklist that I mentioned. It's like Apple is like, okay, it's riding the tailwind of smartphones and app-based consumption, possibly the next operating system. Its customers have this network effect. You can use even a micro example of like the fact that all of our text messages are blue, and and if right. someone has an Android, has a green message, that is a that is a network based switching cost. Like you will second guess switching to a green phone if all of your friends have the blue text message. Um, players in the category, there's like Samsung, there's Google, but it's like okay, Apple has a really compelling brand, so it's like okay, I think they'll be around. Um, so this is the. I don't want to have a monologue. Uh, These are the sorts of things one would go through for that, like that first bullet, which is like, will this business grow with high odds into the future? All right. Back to our other bullets. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, got it. I appreciate uh, you understand the bat. Okay. A couple of the others just wrap them off. So if let's say like the business itself is the horse and by betting on a good horse to win a good race, the next bullet is, who is the jockey on the horse, i.e. the leadership team? Mm. Do we think the leadership team are the right human beings to go execute on the, on the opportunity that we think is so good? Um, the third bullet, um, how much money does it require to then go do all this said stuff? For example, if you were like, hey, I think... I can go compete with Spectrum Internet or Comcast. Boy, every time I call that company, does it? The customer service isn't great. My internet's out. Like we could go. What, like we're going to go. hundred <laughs> percent. I know, right? It's a really great example. Then it's like, okay, how much money does it cost you to go compete? Well, I need to rip up every pipe connecting the connecting the internet, and I need to go rebuild those pipes, and that's going to cost me a billion dollars. So then it's like, okay. Like, I know it's a really good market opportunity. Maybe you're a really great team, but the return on invested capital 
i.e. the dollars needed to actually go unlock this opportunity, just isn't worth my bang for the buck. And so I'll sort of pause here with those three principles. Mm. So can this business grow? Who's the leadership team? What is the what is the money or capital needed to unlock this opportunity? And those three bullet points effectively are like the core tenets of investing in any investment. Right. And what I love what you talked about was that we don't have to be like a math expert or even necessarily a finance expert to kind of think through those things about a company. But we do have to actually spend a little bit of time thinking about that versus just like, hey, my friend down the street gave me this stock tip and I don't know, he made some money. So maybe I should just go like roll some of my money in it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, I probably want to invest that way. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I think what's, what's, what you can do now that let's say you've been armed with a mini framework. Next time you get a stock tip, you can sort of pressure test them on one of those three dimensions, which is like, Oh, that's like really interesting. Like, what makes you think they'll maintain market share tomorrow, not just today? And they'll be like, oh, like I never thought about that. Or how do you think about their management team and like the current CEO and CFO at the helm? <laughs> or you could be like, amazing. How much capital do you think they'll need to continue to have the success? And you'll mm-hmm. sort of stop someone in their tracks just by very, very simple questions. Um, and if they're savvy enough, maybe they can like go back and forth in a debate. And welcome to why investing is such a fun career because sort of like intellectual warfare. It's like, hey, like I deeply believe Apple will be able to maintain its market share against Samsung and Google with these flip phones, whereas someone can come in hot and be like, I actually think now that Steve Jobs is no longer with us, there's structural risks to Apple. Um, So it makes for a fun career. Interesting. Yeah. And and a side note on the flip phones, why are we bringing those back? (laughs) I know, right? Um, really, we got rid of those for a reason. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I know. I may, there, uh, maybe there's some like vintage nostalgia play. Maybe there's, I, I don't know. Maybe it's like you could pack an iPad in your pocket, and all you have to do is just flip it close, and it all of a sudden fits. So I'm going to sort of trust in the world <laughs> and that they had a whole team of researchers researching what they should do, and they tested it. Um, I loved my flip phone growing up, but I sure prefer a touch screen. So let's see what happens. Right, right. Well, I want to talk a little bit about about Titan. Uh, we kind of just on the periphery have talked about it. You're a co-founder, co-CEO, and you're this Titan, I should say, is a really cool fintech startup where you say you want to become the century's answer to fidelity investments. And I think most of us have... It, We may not be able to explain fidelity, what fidelity does necessarily, but we've certainly heard the word, know that they're obviously a player in um, the investing game. So uh, tell me a little bit more about Titan. I know you are backed by some some great investors, Kevin Durant, Will Smith, to name just a few. So how is Titan going to become the century's answer to fidelity? Sure. The... um... There's only, I'm a big student of history. I think many entrepreneurs are like, I'm, I'm building God's gift to earth. It's the new theory of relativity. I'm like, (laughs) I'm like, believe it or not, human beings are more similar than different over time. We have the same sorts of things we seek to do. Just, you know, electricity is a new fire, but like the same use case of like needing to see at night. And so when you, when you apply that lens to the category we're in, it's like, okay, how have human beings across history manage their money? There's only three use cases for like the last thousand years. One is make it go away. And this is like the earliest and the newest use case. It was started in the mid 20th century. Passive products are wonderful, this use case. I push one button and I get the whole supermarket in my basket at once. It's called a diversified ETF. The next one is get out of my way. I literally want to do whatever the heck I would like with my money. The jargon term for that is self-directed brokerage. You could do that on E-Trade. You could do that on TV Ameritrade. You can do that on Robinhood. You name it. And then the third use case is, okay, I want to give my money to someone to do the whole thing for me. 
that's been around since the Phoenicians. The last great operating system built to solve for humanity, wanting to give their money to someone to do the thing for them, is the company called Fidelity. The hallmark technology or vehicle they use, to, like literally, like almost as if you're a passenger in a vehicle and someone's driving your money for you. The hallmark vehicle they use is a thing called a mutual fund. And to a millennial, that two word term probably makes one want to like run away and scream. Totally. That's how, how like all, all of our perceptions on like the clunkiness and the opaqueness and uh, the opacity and uh, um, all that good jazz. And so I was like, all right, we've got, it seems like we have pretty good ways for us to do whatever the heck we want with our money. The millennial generation also has a number of different ways to quote unquote make it go away. It seems like this really, really big, massive use case has yet to have any innovation, i.e., what is like it currently feels like a diesel truck, these like mutual funds and active mm-hmm. ETFs. I was like, I think we can go build Teslas. And step one, let's go build our own Teslas and ship our own drivers in the Teslas and manage capital for as many people that want. And so we have a few Teslas that we're driving today, a large cap stock one offshore, which invests in lots of like China internet stocks, a small cap one, so it's called opportunities. And then one that the one uh, focused on crypto and the master plan is, all right. So we're sort of proving that our products are like Teslas in many different ways. How can we then go bring this technology that we're building to all the people currently driving diesel trucks, i.e. mutual funds. And in doing that, we will officially be the fidelity of the millennial generation, which doesn't sound sexy described (laughs) that way. But to me, it's a really, really massive, multiple thousands of years old problem that I feel a deep sense of duty to be a steward of for at least for us. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. I like it. It's definitely intriguing. I will, I will say I'm on the firm belief that, uh, the mutual fund does feel clunky, outdated, uh, and you know, yet that's still kind of traditional financial principles that are being taught. And it's, I don't know, it's a scratch of the head moment of like, Hmm, I don't know if that still actually works. Yeah. <laughs> we could talk about that for a long time. But, um, <laughs> yeah. It's just like, I, I, because I'm a customer of these things too. And it's like, when you think about what a mutual fund is, which is a really ugly term, there's someone on the other end of it that you give money to, that you give money to, excuse me, who will go invest it. And you can see the little tickers that they invest in. But it's just amazing to me that we'll give, like you mentioned a few folks that are investors in the company, like Kevin Durant, Will Smith. They have the tools to talk to 10 million people at once and say, hey, here's what I'm doing in my life. But for some reason, the folks who are investing your money have no ability to talk to you and say, hey, I'm going to go invest you in Uber stock. Here's why. And so that's a hint at what is uh, one of the core differentiators between a Tesla and a diesel truck, which is the ability for the passengers to be able to communicate to the driver. Um, So this is what uh, keeps me up at night in a good way, trying to go build this out. And is one of the other functions of of using that sort of diesel to Tesla mentality that the opportunity for better returns exists? Uh, yeah. And another one is the ability for these vehicles to drive to new places. So mm. like crypto or venture, which historically were locked for mutual funds. Another is it's cheaper. Like our technology is cheaper than the old Um Another one is when you think about the tools for the driver, so like the steering wheel, the dials, and so forth, those are really, really clunky. So you can think about them as a whole other customer. They're like sort of the customer and the driver's side of the equation. We're like, okay, how do we build the best creator tools in the world for people who want to create financial products? You can almost use like a, a YouTube analogy from that lens. YouTube has incredible creator tools to create video content and other content. And when you apply that same thinking to the financial world, then you're just like, what are the creator tools of the financial world? You like, it's sort of like pulleys and ropes. And uh, we think we can build the best creator tools. So that's, that's what we mean when we say the fidelity 
for our generation. It's sort of like the new platform, which solves a really important use case. Hopefully back to the beginning part of the conversation, we can enable people um, we, or we can manage uh, a lot of money and power it in a really long-term healthy way for a lot of people. Mm, I like it. Yeah. Wow. Okay. We've, We've talked about so much. We could obviously dig a lot deeper. I'm, I know I'm going to have to have you back on the back on the show, but I I love to leave everyone with just some kind of actionable tips. Are there a couple of tips that you can think about that that we can kind of do right now to to start us on our journey to really being able to build wealth and maybe think of think about investing from a different perspective. So one actionable tip. I'm going to give a timely tip. Right now, if I were the pilot of a plane, like let's say a commercial jet going from San Francisco to New York City, right now in the markets, it would be the like, hey, we have some turbulence upcoming. Just buckle in your seatbelt. But don't worry. It's like the usual sort of turbulence. Um, There's lots of like inflation talk. There's lots of COVID talk. There's going to be a lot of misinformation across a number of different media outlets. When you zoom out, what you realize is it's truly just a little bit of turbulence. If you want to go get up and use a bathroom, feel free to do so. Like, go for it. It'll be fine. I'm just saying merely buckle your seatbelt. Um, so if people are considering, oh boy, let, I'm right now fully invested, but I'm going to shift all my money to cash to wait this thing out, I would just say double check a bunch of those thoughts. As the pilot is saying, this is just usual turbulence. We're going to get to New York. Nobody worry. Um, so that would be the one thought I would leave uh, your audience. I love it. That's great. I love the turbulence analysis. I I don't like turbulence, so I can <laughs> neither I, do I. I. This. <laughs> I know. Just let me watch my movie. You know. Right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. But well, um. Yeah. Well, Joe, this has been so so insightful. I'd love for you to tell everyone where they can connect with you and find out more about Titan. Yeah, they can go to titan.com if they want to learn more about Titan. They can connect with me on Instagram or Twitter. Just search Joe Prococo. Um, and uh, yeah, look forward to um, look looking forward to possibly being on again. But this is an awesome combo. I don't know about you, but when someone tells me that I don't know how to make money and they have an answer or solve for that and that it's different than what we've been taught all of these years – it kind of makes the hairs on the back of my head stand up. I'm definitely going to listen. I think we're at somewhere around 780 episodes now of this podcast. And I just have been thinking back over all of the episodes and all of the amazing guests and really kind of honing in this year on the idea of thinking about wealth building differently. And so I think the message that Joe shared is such an important one. And again, I hope it sparks something in you of, of thinking about investing differently going forward into the new year. If you enjoyed this episode, please do me the highest favor, share it with friends, family members, anyone who you know might also think this episode is great to listen to. As always, you can head to the show notes for all the links to our episode guest, as well as our amazing episode sponsors. And I'll see you back here for a fresh new episode to really round out 2021. Hey, you. Yes, you. Before you go, we want to say thanks for listening to this episode of Millennial Money. For all the links, tags, and ads you've heard on today's episode, check out the show notes or go to mmoneypodcast.com where you'll find more episodes to share with your friends. While you're at it, leave us a review and make sure to subscribe wherever you listen so you don't miss out on all the money tips and tricks that will take you from a millennial regular to a millennial money expert. See you back here in a few days with a fresh new episode.